by introducing myself. I am Mel Miles, the Senior Director of Partnerships at Demagi, and I only recently joined Demagi in October from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I worked on the introduction and scale up of malaria products and strategies. So while I'm relatively new to the tech space, in my new role, I'm focusing on driving Demagi's national scale and sustainability efforts, including an exciting new $3 million match for national governments um, that we recently launched in partnership with the Global Fund. So I will be the moderator for today's panel, and I am going to start with a few opening remarks and then introduce our panelists. So I want to start with the problem. Um, the pandemic have, has emphasized how important it is for health systems around the world to both deepen and widen their perspective on digital maturity. This is needed to improve clinical outcomes, streamline costs, build resilience, and increase capacity of frontline workers responding to pandemics. Today, many global systems do not have the digital infrastructure to rapidly flow data into the hands of decision makers. Even further, we also can't ignore that we still do have siloed systems that aim to fulfill project goals at some time, sometimes rather than create a cumulative and modular digital health enterprise. The 2030 Sustainable Development Goals highlight that digital technology has great potential to accelerate progress. However, it's fair to say that the path to digital maturity and digital transformation can feel like it's too big a feat within the resource constrained contract environments that we operate in. Within this context, it's important that we optimize resources for efficiency, solve the most important challenges first, and align through partnerships so that all our individual efforts are exponentially more impactful than their individual parts. On today's topic, um, this panel is specifically focused on digital maturity and partnerships. And we know that multiple digital maturity model, models exist to monitor progress and identify gaps. And we'll hear from some panelists today that have worked closely with countries all around the world on digital assessments. I think it's important to remember it can be far too easy in the process of digitization to simply digitize a paper system. But the real benefit to quality of care from going digital comes from the job aids, payment schemes, remote supervision, and decision making that help workers do their job better. Digital maturity starts with building the core digital features such as digital platforms and data exchange. And on top of that, we can then build innovative components such as virtual care, remote monitoring, artificial intelligence, digital diagnostics, and much more. However, no matter the technology, digital health will be valued and adopted if it's accessible and supports universal access to quality care enhances the efficiency of health systems, is affordable, and strengthens and scales up health promotion, disease prevention, and treatment. So as I was reflecting on this panel, I came back to the principle that digital maturity is a process, not a state. It can't be ignored that um, this is a wicked problem, as my old boss at the Gates Foundation would say. It has no one partner or no one idea offering a solution. And one thing I find helpful when I'm approaching a wicked problem um, or a very complex problem such as this is to think about it as a multi-step model. So step one is always to shrink the change into its component parts. And step two is to design micro -exper experiments to drive that change forward. I think if we're trying to leap into the void, it's too big of a gap, it's too difficult. Transformation is a process, it's agile, it's iterative, it requires experimentation. Um, and the motto of shrink the change and constantly experiment is a motto that has served me well as I've approached um, this problem. I also wanted to reflect a bit on just the history and where we've come from as we think about digital maturity. I went back and looked and it was in 2005 that the World Health Assembly first, um, can first advised member states to consider drawing up strategic plans for their e-health services. It's been over 15 years since that date. And today we have more than 120 countries that have developed such strategies and policies, but it has taken the small incremental change to get there. And we have plenty of work to do to still operationalize these plans. So on that note, um, I'm excited today for this conversation on digital maturity and partnership to dive more into the how, particularly of how we operationalize these national strategies and introduce our impressive line of speakers um, including some from the biggest donors funding national governments as they go on their own journey to digital transformation. 
So before I kick things off, I just want to acknowledge um, and remind all of us of the WHO's new digital strategy. And it has four guiding principles that I thought um, I would just share as we kick off this conversation. The first being principle number one, acknowledge that institutionalization of digital health is the net in the national health system requires a decision and commitment by countries. Principle number two, recognize that successful digital health initiatives require an integrated strategy. Principle number three, promote the appropriate use of digital technologies for health. And principle number four, recognize the urgent need to address the major impediments faced by the least developed countries implementing digital health technology. So on this note, I, um, I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves, but they are Meredith Baker, who is the Senior Manager of Private Sector Partnerships and Innovation for Gavi, Lakshmi Balkatron, the Senior Director of Digital Health for the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Peter Okabukula, the, um, a partner leading the Digital Health Initiative and Strategies at McKinsey and Company, and then Dr. Beatrice Thom, the Specialist for m and &E and Private Sector Engagement at the Global Fund. So just in terms of logistics, we're gonna spend about 30 minutes in discussion and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions. So please hold your questions for now. And when you're invited, um, we'll ask you to type them in the chat box at the end. Um, so on this note, I would love to invite our panelists to introduce themselves and say just a few highlights of what your organization is working on in digital maturity. So we're going to start off with Meredith from um, the Global Fund and just go in the order of um, panelists that I just read off. So Meredith, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Mel. Um, yes, yeah, so as Mel mentioned, I'm at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Um, my role is mostly centered on private sector partnerships and innovation. So a lot of what that means within Gavi is being the focal point for digital health and data primarily. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Gavi, Gavi is a global alliance that consists of the Gates Foundation, WHO, and UNICEF. So Gavi is the kind of convening or coordinating mechanism for those organizations as related to global routine immunization. Um, Gavi also is the kind of lead convener for the COVAX facility, which is delivering COVID-19 vaccines primarily to lower and middle income countries, but 144 countries in total. So it's a really exciting time, I think, to be talking about digital health maturity. Um, as lots of people have seen, there's sort of that funny meme that goes around about what pushed your organization to digital transformation. It was COVID. We feel that way about a lot of our Gavi supported countries as well. <laughs> uh, we're seeing a lot of really exciting investments, I think, around digital systems and digital health information um, that certainly supports the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine but leads to longer term outcomes for countries as they build out digital health systems. So it's a really exciting time, I think, to be on the investment side and to be in the partnership side to see how those things all coordinate. Um, I should also preface that I'm relatively new to Gavi as well, similar to Mel. So I joined in November, um, but happy to, to take questions on COVAX and Gavi. And if I can't answer them, I, I can always get back to you. Um, I should also probably mention my background is in social enterprise tech. Um, so I've worked for a number of companies working in countries um, directly with governments as clients, as well as probably many of your organizations um, to build out digital health systems and create partnerships on the ground. So I think digital health maturity is something we've all probably spent, I guess, I was going to say a decade, but then Mel, you mentioned 2005 was when WHO put that out. So it's been even longer than I realized. Um, you know, we're still having these conversations and there are big roadblocks to why. So really excited to be a part of this conversation and to hear from this panel and to hear from all of you and, and to dive into some of those discussion topics. Thanks. Thanks, Meredith. How about we go to Lakshmi? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Lakshmi. I'm the Senior Director of Digital Health at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, or CHAI. Um, I am a computer engineer by training and have been working within digital health um, at CHAI basically um, for the last uh, eight to nine years, uh, working on supply chain information systems, uh, lots of data analytics, data systems, data visualization for maternal and newborn health, child health, uh, vaccines and immunization. Um, and 
and uh, lots of work on disease surveillance and disease elimination, uh, particularly for malaria and neglected tropical diseases. Uh, I, I completely agree with Meredith. I think this is an exciting time to be in this uh, space. And we've sort of seen the use of digital te uh, technology as well as the penetration of uh, smartphones and connectivity increased by leaps and bounds over the last um, at least eight years that I've been involved in this work, but um, even more so I'd say since the 15 years since the WHO uh, put out that recommendation. And I think we're seeing a lot more um, thought going into how we work on digital technologies and um, uh, by national governments in terms of how they want to leverage digital tech for health uh, and be more um, intentional uh, about uh, just what we want to achieve as well as how we go about doing that in a, a scalable and sustainable manner. So I'm um, very glad to be part of this panel, looking forward to the discussion. Um, in terms of the work that we do at CHAI that's related to digital maturity, I think we've been working on uh, digital health for a, a many number of years uh, and now are getting to a stage of coordinating and thinking about our own role in this uh, in this space. Um, so we do a lot of work, like I mentioned, around disease surveillance, disease elimination across uh, regions in Asia, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Central America. Uh, we also recently um, deepened our work on digitizing public health campaigns, uh, so bed net distribution campaigns, insecticide spraying campaigns, um, immunization campaigns, and so on, um, to work around um, logistics management systems, lab information systems. And in doing all of that, I think we've um, spent a lot of time thinking about as well as working with governments on strengthening digital health foundations. Um, so what does it mean to have a digital health team or an IT, ICT team? Um, what does it mean um, from a leadership and governance perspective, uh, as well as budgeting and thinking about staff and thinking about standards and guidance and policies for that? Um, so again, just excited uh, that we're having these conversations um, and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Lakshmi. Peter, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Mel. Uh, excited to, to join today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, my name is Peter Okibukola. And I'm a partner at McKinsey & Company, where I lead McKinsey's public health work across LMICs. Um, but I also lead a ton of our work in digital health transformations, personally being responsible for driving large-scale country-level transformations uh, in, in health uh, technology uh, on digital readiness more broadly. Uh, I also recently published an article on, on the journey to digital maturity in LMICs, which I'm just going to put in the chat box for folks who are interested uh, to take a look at. Uh, so I've done a lot of work in this space over, my, over the last 10 years in McKinsey, but more broadly over the last 20 plus years of my, my career in medicine. So my background is in medicine, so a PhD in public health. And I have done a lot of work in the intersection of you know, digital tools with service delivery on one side to epidemic control to um, a, a ton of other supply chain and, and delivery, a ton of other topics, right? So interesting to see how over the last kind of couple of 20 years or so, the digital maturity across the world, across LMIC especially, has really um, evolved, right? And I'm really keen to have this conversation uh, to see how, A, the tools that have been developed, but more importantly, how we're creating the set of enablers and systems to ensure that the the gains of the last two, three years with the COVID pandemic are not lost, right? So think about the last uh, two, three years with COVID, we've been at the forefront of really supporting countries. So I've worked with something like 10 countries on their response, but also leveraging digital tools to get that done. So how do we leverage the, the, the journey over the last couple of years to ensure that the future is uh, even more bright for all of us? So excited for this conversation. And back to you, Mel. Thanks, Peter. All right, and lastly, Beatrice. Thanks, Mao. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Beatrice Thomas. I'm, I'm a physician by training as well, uh, public health specialist uh, and specialist in infectious diseases. I currently at, uh, at the Global Fund uh, at a team called Monitoring Evaluation Country Analysis Team. So we do um, support that has to do with monitoring evaluation in the countries that uh, the Global Fund supports, uh, data systems, but uh, not limited uh, to, to health information systems, community health information systems, um, 
program evaluation, program review. So anything that has to do with monitoring the, the progress uh, of the investments in the countries. So the Global Fund, uh, for the ones who are not um, so familiar, is, is a partnership uh, by de definition, uh, a, a great uh, funding mechanisms that inf invest in, um, in, in countries through mostly the ministries, uh, and ministries of health. Uh, no, do we lose it? Oh, did I freeze? Am I back? Yes, you're back. I'm back, sorry. Now I was just giving a brief overview of the Global Fund. Uh, so the, a global fund, the Global Fund uh, finances um, mainly programs uh, fight, to fight HIV, TB and malaria in over 100 countries, but not, um, not only limiting to the diseases themselves, there's a, a growing investment um, in, our, in what we call RSSA, Resilient and Sustainable Systems for Health. And of course, we've seen a growing investment in, in, digital, uh, in digital health uh, overall, of course. And again, the efforts uh, at the Global Fund to strengthen digital systems, digital health in countries are, are very vast uh, and they go you know, to all the, the, the technical teams, uh, including the, the health system strengthening team. I can speak a little more uh, from the data perspective. So um, there's been a growing investment in supporting uh, health information systems that are digital. So DHIS2 being the, 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 the health management information system more commonly used uh, across uh, the countries uh, supported by the fund. But um, of course, support is agnostic to, to system, but um, for in the data space, um, there is again a, a growing and very large investment in uh, in supporting countries in putting together their health management information systems, but um, uh, as well as logistics uh, management systems, lab information systems as a, as a growing investment as well. Uh, I would like to particularly mention a project that I'm very close uh, to that I, that I help coordinate at the fund with relates to strengthening community health information systems. So it's a, it's a project uh, co-funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, again, to strengthen community health uh, information systems by digitizing them. So we are um, in four countries, uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, and Uganda. We are, we're coming in uh, on a three-year investment to support already ongoing efforts of these countries in digitizing community health information. Um, so again, agnostic of the solutions that they are proposing, um, this investment is really coming in to support what they already have in mind, uh, their own uh, vision for community digitization. And I think it's interesting to, to mention uh, to the group as well that because it's co-funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, that uh, there's an intention as well to foster collaboration between um, global health uh, tech lead leaders, including from the private sector, with the existing uh, private sector working in the space of community health data science in these countries. So we really want to, want to match um, skills and expertise, uh, trying to, again, strengthen the, the local capacity, not only from the public sector, which is, of course, our, our, our main um, focus, but also the private sector that we know contribute and a lot uh, to, this, to this space and, and, and increasingly. So just as a, as a very general um, overview of, of, of this project, as, as an example of, of the many, again, initiatives that the Global Fund is supporting in terms of strengthening countries' digital health uh, in general. And really happy to join this panel, uh, a real honor, and really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Beatrice. So I want to transition to our first topic, which is building digital maturity in country. And unfortunately, our Ministry of Health panelist, the Director of Information from Benin, Eunice Eurek, wasn't able to join us today after all. So I want to kick us off with this question um, of how we build tech capacity and drive digital maturity in the country. And I know we're missing um, our country representative who was supposed to be here on the panel, but um, Lakshmi, I'd love to start with you because I know Chai has been engaged in country assessments across multiple regions. What have you found to be the most consistent gaps in digital capabilities? Um, and recognizing this is a long, long journey, what do you see as some realistic next steps to build local capacity? 
Sure, happy to start, and, but would love for others to chime in as well in terms of what your experience has been. Um, so we have indeed conducted assessments uh, across a number of countries, not necessarily specific to digital health, but usually have digital health components to it just to understand, for example, what uh, the disease surveillance um, system looks like in a country or what logistics and supply chain systems look like in a country. and. Um, uh, complementary to those sort of what are the digital health uh, foundations. I think as I somewhat mentioned in my introduction, we have seen this um, grow in leaps and bounds over the last um, five, 10 years. So when we uh, talk about whether there's a digital health strategy in place or whether there's a digital health team or an IT team that is cross-cutting in a ministry of health in place, those things have become more and more established and much more widely uh, present in a, in a number of countries. And there are dedicated IT staff for digital health staff, which may not have existed um, 10 years ago in a number of countries. Um, what we've also seen is more governance and leadership around this. So a ministry of health uh, sort of commitments around um, having those teams in place um, and having leaders in place putting um, uh, tech uh, aspects into budgets, whether that's maintenance and management or having tech staff within budgets, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about this in terms of the growth that we've seen, but I also think that these are the areas where we still see uh, gaps, particularly around policies and guidance for technology, whether there's an e-health architecture um, in mind for a country as to how the different country um, systems should work with each other, whether there's guidance or standards around integration and interoperability, um, standards around how hardware is uh, distributed uh, to health workers and managed and maintained so that uh, programs are not necessarily, um, uh, we've seen community health workers with three or four smartphones sometimes, for example. And so uh, a lot more of the SOPs, policies and guidance that get into the nitty gritties of um, having a help desk or an IT support desk or having um, mobile device management platforms and hardware management, et cetera, is a big gap that we see um, uh, in, in a number of countries and having um, enough staff and capacity or the ability to subcontract local uh, tech vendors uh, to manage and maintain systems beyond grant funding or project specific funding is another one that, that comes up fairly. Um, and I think just having unified data foundations and monitoring when we have a uh, project specific uh, funding or program specific funding, there isn't as much investment going into say having a central master facility list or a central HR information system, et cetera. So I think like while we've seen um, a lot of momentum, um, those are some of the areas where we still see um, some gaps in what we were working with governments. Um, to figure out how to address them, even if that's through project specific or program specific funding. Uh, no, thank you. Peter, I'd love to hear from you next on this topic of um, building digital maturity in country, because I know um, a majority of countries have national digital health strategies. And um, McKinsey is deeply involved in a number of them supporting various digital health initiatives, but we all know that a strategy is only one foundation. Um, and if there's not strong funding and an operational plan behind it, it's not successful. So how do you think the community can do a better job at the micro planning, planning and the, oper the operalization of digital health strategies? Um, and what are some factors that should be considered as we move from kind of strategy to execution? Great, thanks Amel for that. Uh, Lakshmi, I think I, I really echo all of the, you know, the points you raised. Uh, those are really foundational the lack of an articulated policy or an inclination by government to say we are committed to uh, you know, digital health is, you know, is a big challenge. And to your point now as well, think about the WHO principle, that's the first principle, right? But again, to your point, right, with the rubber meets the road, it's not just you know, the, the policy articulation, it's also what happens on the ground, right? And if you, if you, you know, my experience working with uh, eight countries in recent times in Africa, right, has been, there have been a confluence of three or four factors that you know may mitigate against um, such progress despite the policy. Right, the first one will be the donors uh, and their and their own intentions. Right, so you have donors who come in and say, "I want to focus my attention on a an app for let's say family planning services, for example." Right, and then go ahead and develop that app and develop that system 
focus on that particular problem, right? But then at the same time, you have other 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 partners who are also developing parallel systems, right? So again, we're here by replicating the, the challenges we've had with the traditional programs, where you have vertical systems that may or may not talk to each other, right? So the whole construct of interoperability becomes more critical. And I think Beatrice, you had talked about DHIS too, right? That's a, a system that aims to become almost like a grandfather to money medicine and, and, and have the connections to others. So getting that interoperability backbone is critical to ensure that we're not just working in silos. So that's the first kind of real, real, real challenge. The second piece for me is also building local capacity to manage systems, right? So many times we all, I mean, we're all guilty of this, right? We, we, we come into the countries and create these flashy systems that will work, right? Because we are supporting, right? We have the database administrators, we have the, the technical folks who are supporting it. But the question is what happens when you have to deploy to the last mile, right? So if you're in a health facility, you're a nurse who's having to interface with this tool, um, how do you get the support? Do you have the people in country who can actually give you the support, the backend support as needed? So lack of building the local capacity to do this is a real challenge that I've seen over time. Um, and, and even if you build local capacity, just the fact that you know, these, these skills are really in high demand, unfortunately means that we lose them. Uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about like a couple of countries now where you know, we spent three years building capacity of the corporate team to support these wonderful systems and then they get poached <laughs> by other companies, the private sector in some cases or by donors in some cases, right? So it's an interesting challenge you have to try to overcome. Maybe the third that I'll also, also lay, put on, on the table is, for me, I think even in the initial design process for some of these tools, we are not listening to the voice of the user. So there's a lot of, um, we assume that we know the challenges, we assume that we understand how these tools are developed, but I think for you know one of the biggest lessons we've learned at McKinsey is the human-centered design approach is invaluable, right? So getting the perspective of the folks who are literally on the front lines and helping use their guidance to develop the tools and also continue to improve them is critical. If you don't do that in the long run, you know, folks can just they can buy into it, you can have this fancy launch of the process, but in the long term, will they use it, right? That's that's a really big consideration. And maybe the final piece, and then I'll I'll hand off is. You know, as we think really about digital maturity, right? One of the real, you know, one of the big assumptions people make is that it's underpinned primarily by mobile penetration rates, right, and broadband use, right? That's one one piece of the of the pie. But there's a lot more to data infrastructure than that, right? Do you have a real backbone, a real sense of digital uh, enablement by the population and by government systems, and you know, ensuring that you have the, the entire structure to support whatever you're building on it, right? The structure can only go as high as the foundation. So for me, I will say literally spending time with broader stakeholders, just apart, apart from healthcare stakeholders, right? The Ministry of, Ministry of Technology, right? The Ministry of Communications and understanding how do you build an infrastructure for the country that goes beyond healthcare? Because if you think about it, right? As we're building healthcare systems, overlaying that, for example, in many cases with payment systems. So you know that you have it, you know, tools that, develop, that deliver health, but it's also payment connected to that, right? You're connecting that to uh, education in some cases, social protection in some cases. So getting that whole ecosystem view is critical. So for us in health, I think it's important for us to think beyond just our own remit, but think about how we get the entire ecosystem and the entire you know, economy you know, into this uh, will be critical. So those are my thoughts at this stage. I'll put it, send it back to you now. Thanks, Peter. Um... So I want to ask Beatrice to share a few things, um, moving more to the donor side. We know the Global Fund is one of the biggest donors in the world of, of, um, of making investments aligned with national strategies. And when it comes to advancing digital maturity, and particularly in light of the COVID pandemic, I'm curious what renewed demand are you seeing from countries? Um, and what else are you learning about building capacity for digital maturity in countries? Thanks, Mel. And uh, I, I really want to first uh, really um, uh, re-emphasize uh, what Lakshmi and Peter mentioned with regards to, you know, the sustainability um, um, lens that we need to, to give to this all. So you might be aware that uh, the Global Fund um, mission is very much aligned with the country needs and, and country mission. So approaches are really meant to be uh, bottom up and not the other way around. So we really, um, and of course, each country has a different reality and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the approaches will vary. But uh, I think in every case, the attempt is 
has been to really try to address uh, what uh, you know what we're discussing here in terms of governance, the country ownership. Uh, there's nothing that you can, uh, you know, that, that, that we really wouldn't want to be promoting what Peter described. You know, like it's very in the siloed approach that are donor led, that are really trying to respond to donor needs and interests. We really want to move away from this. We really want to to be able to reinforce again countries' capacity to one develop their own digital health strategies and implementation plan to set aside a budget for that and I, I agree with Peter across different domains uh, not limited to health uh, so again the the, the the mission is really aligned with uh, with what country brings as uh, as uh, you know as core to them um, and of course with the pandemic we've seen uh, given the the, the the DHIS2 example we've seen that uh, the countries that already had uh, DHIS2 uh, functional up and running were more much more rapidly uh, able to 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 deploy modules that were covid related and and had information real time on covid cases and that's etc oftentimes even better than you know more developed countries that don't have a, a, a health information system uh, which has such a solid backbone so i think the message from the pandemic is that you really have to have perennial uh, if you think about data, perennial health information systems, surveillance systems to the last mile, so community health uh, workers playing a key role there um, in supporting surveillance and, and, and response uh, as well, of course. So again, I think um, We've seen a growing demand, of course, and uh, you may be aware that uh, the, the, the Global Fund deployed um, a, an extra, an additional funding mechanism um, to uh, support uh, countries in terms of um, their, uh, their COVID response. Um, this was called the C19RM, C19 uh, response mechanism. And we've seen that there was a lot of, much of the request, uh, in particular with regards to data, which is the, the space that, I, that I'm more familiar with at, at the fund, was with regards to strengthening the already existing digital system, so DHIS2, but not limited to um, strengthening tools uh, at the, again, at the, at the last mile, so strengthening um, data collection tools, job at the community level. So this all came to, to, to surface uh, even more with, uh, with the C19RM, this uh, response mechanism that was put uh, together very fast in order to, to address uh, the needs. We worked closely with Gavi in terms of um, not, not really deploying COVID vaccine, but to deploy anything that had to do with the systems, information systems that would respond to that. So again, I think, that as uh, I think Peter mentioned, we really need to make sure that we, we keep the, those lessons learned, what we learned that we could do during these uh, this crisis and take it forward and again is with it, it's with again country ownership uh, governance uh, leadership but uh, with a lot of partnership i mean i think we all learned that we can't uh, work alone um but I, I think immediate thoughts i'll stop here thanks mel thanks beatrice no um at demagi we've also reflected a lot on our covid response work and it's been interesting we've been asked to share success stories on the global stage of where countries have used digital tools to respond to covid and as we reflected internally all of the examples we were sharing we started almost 10 years before the pandemic and i think it's really important to admit that both as a tech company and also um, in this community that the you know, the successes we're celebrating and the actual um, impact and achievement of dis digital tools often takes a long time to, to facilitate that roadmap. And so we know donor cycles are a certain way and we know countries only have certain budgets. Um, but even as we internally look at our success, it really feels like it's a 10 year timeline um, to prepare for that. So on, um, on that note, kind of, I wanna shift a bit to the partnership lens here because we intentionally named this session Digital Maturity and Partnership. Um, and we know building tech capacity in country requires a joint effort across a broad set of partners with diverse capabilities over multiple decades. Um, and historically, there are lots of examples of ill-coordinated or disjointed efforts. Um, and you know, in the, the world that I come from, which is malaria, I think it's a, it's a vertical disease area. There's certain um, you know, systems, whether that be policy or advocacy plays that you use to introduce, introduce and scale up new tools. I think in the, the digital health space, it's much more horizontal and more complicated um, and can lead to information fragmentation and poor delivery of services. 
Um, so it's not an easy problem to solve. Maybe one of those wicked problems. But Meredith, I know you are leading partnership and engagement with the private sector at Gavi and thinking through the role of partnership in this. So how do we build digital maturity through country partnerships? Um, yeah, and what is your take on various public and private sector partnerships that can really drive and, and support countries in their digital maturity journey? Yeah. Fabulous question. <laughs> so, I mean, it's nice to, to kind of hear everyone speak first. I think Beatrice really capably explained how Global Fund and Gabby work, and we have a very similar approach as two organizations to that, um, in that we work directly with countries, we support country-driven investments, um, countries apply for certain portfolios, we give guidance on different areas to invest in. Um, and I think, you know, Gabby and Global Fund are similar in that we're also trying to create ecosystems for countries, right? And as we move, you know, further and further along in, in kind of the digital maturity journey, you know, we're finding that there are lots of players who are not at the table. And it's, you know, it's really unfortunate that we couldn't get the minister from Benin to be on the panel today, because this is the voice that's always missing from this conversation, right? Um, and, you know, we've noticed that at Gavi, you know, typically we've had a very Geneva approach to this question, right? Okay, well, countries apply, we give the money, we manage the grant, right? And you know, now there's lots and lots of really interesting thought coming out about, okay, we know there's lots of other players. We have this great you know, civil society community. We have this great private sector community and all of these folks who wanna help. You know, how can we bring those pieces together and start to make it work? And I think previously we thought about this as a donor kind of from a resource mobilization lens, right? Okay, we'll go out, we'll talk to tech companies and we'll get them to give us stuff. And then we'll go and we'll decide what country to go to. <laughs> And now we're finding, oh, that doesn't work because, you know, countries need to have ownership over that ecosystem and they need to have ownership and choice over those decisions. And so now our question is, okay, what is the guidance that's needed from us and what is the role that we should play in building those connections? And how can we create, you know, kind of a circle of enabling partners who might be private sector, might be folks with resources, might be local innovators, right? Might be lots of these solutions that we pass over a lot because they don't make it to that same global stage. Um, who are the decision makers and do they agree with the challenges, right? We can say all day that there are these great digital health strategies. Was it some guy who wrote that five years ago and now the administration has changed over and they don't agree with those priorities. So you're working on bad data, right? So really kind of, you can say something's a challenge but if you don't have really good agreement at the decision-making level, um, you know, you can't start to bring solutions. So, you know, we're doing this in a few ways, I think on, on different levels, um, you know, for COVAX obviously is this kind of massive global movement uh, with lots of different moving parts. So it's honestly a little bit harder to create those more bespoke country solutions. Um, and yet the urgency is so much greater. So that's the big tension I think that we're feeling now. But on the larger, you know, long-term sustainable routine immunization scale, we're rethinking how we bring innovation to some of the country solutions and how that should involve private sector. So, you know, does that look like smaller workshops in countries where we're saying, hey, this is the challenge that you've identified as a decision maker around routine immunization, as well as the COVID rollout. Um, you know, we have these partners in the social media sphere or in the supply chain sphere. Uh, they're willing to offer X, Y, and Z, you know, whether that's financing or assets or expertise, um, you know, and then countries can say, that's great because this is what we've done and here's our gap. So I think we're now starting to look at it as how do we kind of fill the gap rather than we bring solutions and try to match so that kind of partnering ecosystem is developing quite a bit. Um, and part of that plays out in how Gabby thinks about digital health strategy and kind of long-term digital health investment guidance as well. Thanks, Meredith. And I love that you're bringing up um, the a bit of more of the enabling environment. And that was actually going to be my next question because there are like these digital determinants of health, and we know that we need like information literacy and access to phones and access to Wi-Fi, and that absolutely is important. Um, but we have this finite resource envelope, right? That we have to stratify and sub-geographies that we have to optimize, that we and countries have to make trade-offs about what to do first and what not to do, what to do next, and honestly, what not to do. Um, and so down-selecting and phasing activities and really aligning partners on that phasing of activities becomes really important. I think, you know, I, I'm joining this a bit new in terms of being in the tech space, but everyone talks about the enabling environment and all these pieces that feel abstract, but really, whether it's leadership, governance, political buy-in, that really actually drives success. 
Um, and so I'm just curious, and from a donor perspective, maybe starting with Beatrice or you, then we can move on. What do you see as the key levers to influencing this enabling environment? Um, and what can maybe donors do better to actually direct resources to those key levers? Thanks, Mel. It's a key question, right? And I think we've started to discuss that already, I think. And, and again, I think for Global Fund, uh, anything has to be country owned and, and country led, right? So I think, um, and at the Global Fund, and I think in uh, as part of other organizations, uh, growth and, 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 and path, it, it, we've seen more consultative, if that's a word, um, uh, processes really. So you really include, uh, like Meredith was just included, how do you include the private sector? How do you include community? So I think we've seen this, uh, uh, increasingly, um, for example, for to set up the, this the COVID uh, response mechanism, one of the uh, the requirements was that you had to have a, have a funding request that, that really had uh, civil society representation, that had uh, uh, community-based organizations uh, represented. So if you make this a requirement, you know, just people will need to think uh, in country how to be more inclusive and, and have all these voices heard. It's on their interest. So I think, uh, again, having more um, broad engagement of the, of, the, of the related stakeholders, et cetera, is key. And again, under the, the, the governance of, uh, of, you know, of, of governments uh, and state leaders, this is, again, the approach uh, of the Global Fund. And I think, if you think about you know the, the enablers, I think it's an invite to to think to go back to the basics really. So uh, basics uh, in the sense that if if you want to have you know if you have a digital health strategy that has a vision, a clear um, clear objectives, targets, etc. But you need to think okay, so what is my infrastructure? What's uh, how about connectivity, access to electricity? Um, Capacity building of uh, the, the of the people in the in, in the in the on the front line. So all of this again, like, it, it is really the the the, the basics. Um, oftentimes we hear about you know like real like shiny solutions for data visualization and triangulation. We don't know what this is built upon. What is the source of data? Does this come from paper-based registries? From um, community health workers that are not necessarily equipped to do their job, including uh, to report, so how how can you really think about the end of the spectrum? Really, I I oftentimes in my work, at least, and I think the global fund tries to do that. We need to go back to the to the to the to where the work starts. What is the source of the you know? I mean, I, I tend to go back to the data as an example because it is my universe. But what is it that you're you're starting from? So if you don't invest, and again, this and this is a real key. Uh, challenge because um, investments in infrastructures are just immense, even for a for a funder like Global Fund. So it is very challenging to put this on the table, but we just need to address it. Otherwise, we'll just have uh, solutions that don't go beyond the pilot phase. And this is, you know, what we really want to 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 avoid. So again, I think, again, I couldn't emphasize more country ownership and and and, and a clear like you know governance framework for digitizing while always reflecting back on what is uh, what are the basics that you need to, to respond to over. Thanks, Beatrice. Meredith or anyone else have anything to add on um, key levers? I just wanna jump back in. I think Beatrice is right as always um, <laughs> about that perspective, but I think there's one piece that, that is missing as well that I forgot to mention, I think is uh, when we think about the whole system is, you know, Peter mentioned last mile in implementation, we think a lot about end users or last mile users too, right? And I think we have this, you know, Lakshmi was talking about this very core middle section, right? Who's kind of running the data, building the systems, maintaining the systems, the IT departments, the Ministry of IT. And then we've talked a lot about government and policy level, right? And then there's also this kind of bottom layer, right? That supports, I think, in a lot of times weighs much more heavily on long-term sustainability or maturity than we realize. And it's that last mile of kind of culturally how people adapt to the technology, right? Do people wanna have their kids' fingerprints scanned at a clinic? You know, like, <laughs> do people feel okay having their data entered into a tablet? Um, do people feel comfortable having their photo taken for a cash transfer program? You know, there's lots of pieces like that, that I think as, 
as implementers or as program designers, you know, we think about the policy side a lot. We think about governance and we think about kind of implementation and setting the systems up, but we don't always think about that cultural piece. And if you look kind of historically at systems that have worked really well, that's always a key component, right? Is, is kind of culturally how these systems are accepted. Um, is there a demand? And that's another, I mean, it's a little biased coming from the private sector team, but you know, I think that's another role that private sector has to play is when you look at large uptake of systems, you know, how has Facebook been successful? Because they have this really great mindset towards end users, right? They wanna make technology that's engaging and useful. Um, you know, when you see more folks wanting to buy smartphones in lower middle income countries, there is a cultural kind of component behind that that is, I wanna be connected. There's something valuable to me here. So, you know, when you think about long-term and these systems, it's important to think about the value that those folks are gonna get out of it because you know, the government piece and the implementation piece are a very small part of the population. And so when you're thinking about scaling, what does scaling mean? You know, is that multiple countries, is that country level, even if that's district or regional level, it's important to think about who makes up the populations in those areas and what they get out of these systems. Yeah. I love that you're bringing this up, Meredith. And I think it's so important to make users, users' jobs better, to make it easier and to make their life better. Because I think about technology and even as I registered for this conference, right, there was this step of like filling out the form and then they sent me another email to fill in like another form to get my login. And I was thinking about how even that feels like a barrier and hard and how easy we actually need to make it for people and why I didn't want to do that, right, and waited on that email until yesterday. It's the same reason sometimes my health workers don't send in their data and just to acknowledge that human an element and human interaction and in all of this. Um, Peter, I do want to get your thoughts on, on this a little bit. I know I've worked with McKinsey. I know you work across sectors, right? We're talking about the health sector here. Digital transformation is being driven across sectors that have more of um, monet opportunities to monetize, um, that there is business in Africa that's very quickly growing using tech. And so I'm curious your reflections on maybe what we can learn from other sectors doing this. Um, and why health is so behind. Real question, Meredith, I was, I was nodding vigorously when you were speaking about the, <laughs> the cultural aspect of things, right? I just, we just have maybe different nomenclature. I, mean, I, I think we're doing more of the human-centered design um, question, but it's totally right, right? The idea that the, the users or the people who are using the, this tool need to come first, right? Their perspectives are critical. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of <laughs> lend my voice to that point, right, very strongly. And then, you know, we, We've done quite a lot of work at McKinsey across the digital divide. So if I think about the health transformations we've undertaken, right? One of the starting points for us has always been, what can we learn from the private sector? What can we learn from you know, fast moving consumer goods companies? What can we learn from tech companies? What can we learn from you know, um, uh, uh, these you know, very successful um, you know, personal finance companies in Africa and, and beyond, right? To say, how do, we, how do we set up correctly to get scale quickly? Um, there's very interesting perspectives that I want to share. There's two perspectives, right? I think that are slightly different from how we think in the health sector that they think, right? The first thing is many times we as health folks think more from a perspective of social impact. And, and so when we think about social impact, we might tend to underestimate the requirements of, you know, acceptability, commercialization, or scale, because we just think about this as we're just trying to do good. Right. Let's get these surveillance systems out there. We, we're not really concerned about the the, the pricing part of it, the, the, the commercialization of it. Right. But I do think in thinking that way, we're missing very strongly, you know, the perspective of how do we ensure that the product is acceptable to people, and how do we make sure that not only the acceptable, but something that's easy for them to use in the long run. Right. And it's important for me to say this because many of the time, many, many times when we did a study in the in the in the document I sent out earlier, we noticed that a lot of the the tool started off with a donor-based, very you know, NGO-type thinking, and out and, and pushing the thinking about sustainability financially is the long run, right? To say, you know, you know, donor is going to write the check right now. In five years, when there's no check written, the question is, who pays for this? But people, well, it's fine. The government is going to pay for it. Well, the government has other competing demands. So, how do we ensure that we can commercialize these tools in you know, properly? Only very few tools in healthcare have been able to monetize. The usefulness to, to society, right? And able to ensure a constant stream of income. And so for me, I really think it's a lot of work that we need to do in healthcare to really think about how do we get either end users, insurance companies, some type of way for us to get funding for our programs in the long run, 
without ultimately just deferring to what I call lazy thinking of, oh, we're going to get the government to pay for it. Because think about it, we really struggled across the board. Even I'm sure now, in your previous work in malaria, right, you probably had many interventions where like, oh, yeah, we're going to get the government to pay. Well, good luck with that, you know? <laughs> so it's a real question about how do we ensure we properly think about commercialization and ensuring that we can actually get the funding right in the long run. That's one big learning, I think, for me from, from other, other fields. The second other learning for us uh, over time has been the cool idea of technology is not the solution. It's not the first thing, but it's, it's, it's a consequence of everything else, right? I feel like we, we are in health, at least my perspective, are so in, in, we're so amazed by technology. We're so, we think technology is like the, the thing and we default to refer to it first, right? In my experience, for example, in, in the Nigeria health system transformation, we, we noticed that over the last maybe 10, 15 years, there have been 22 different attempts to launch you know, uh, health systems uh, transformations using tool, digital tools that have failed. And the reason is people always came starting with technology, right? So everyone else knows that's, that's not the case, but I think we're kind of slow to appreciate that. And so helping uh, understanding that A, we can tell tech what we want and they can you know, work around our needs, all right, number one. But also thinking through, do you need to buy off the shelf technology or do you want to customize and build yours, right? These are questions that I think we need to start thinking about critically, but from a perspective of technology is helping me and I'm not going to be beholden to technology. It's something that I think we have to learn quickly. Those are, those are my two perspectives on some learnings from other, other industries. Back to you, Mel. No, that's really helpful. And um, I mean, this is my I'm only a few months into my very first role at a tech company. I've been on the donor side and the country side my whole career. But as I've stepped in to reflect, there is a market of kind of donors and USAID contracts that are funding technology. Um, but where is that demand from countries? It's not there or from individuals, right? And how do you actually make a product such as a WhatsApp or a Facebook or something that individuals want so much because it makes their job better. It makes life easier that they want to buy it. Um, so I really appreciate that perspective, Peter. All right, I have one more topic area and then I'm gonna invite the audience to ask questions. So if you wanna um, take this opportunity to just drop in the Q&A your question for um, a question for the panelists. Um, the last question topic is around sustainability. So when digital technology is introduced, obviously a key objective is to find ways to build capacity, um, create a digitally capable health workforce, um, these needs vary from country to country, but often include leadership and government governance and capacity building. Um, so I would love for us to discuss how we can support um, informed decisions and really lay the groundwork for sustainability. Because again, as we see as a tech company, right, we could run this business that is just making, just selling the technology without actually offering long-term value or sustainability. And if we're really honest with ourselves and create critique our work, we see um, multiple failures in terms of projects ending and um, essentially stopping and all of that value essentially disappearing. And I think that there's a, a different way to do it. And, and I would love for maybe Lakshmi to, I know you do a lot of work um, in country, you have technical support units um, advising countries all around the world. Um, in terms of the governance and partnership model and anything else that you found that has worked to really facilitate national ownership and buy-in, um, so that you're not making these rapid decisions or funding these rapid contracts that may actually not lead to sustainability in the long term. Sure. Um, so I, I was reflecting on this as Peter was talking about sort of commercialization of, um, of tech and thinking about that more longer term plan for technology before sort of relying on or just assuming that government's going to pay for something. Um, and our approach to this, though, by no means have we, I, I wouldn't say it's been, we've had lots of success with this or anything, is essentially think about that advocacy to government from the beginning of the of the. Uh, project or the when we start implementing the system itself that if if our expectation is that government will be managing and maintaining these systems and paying for these systems four years down the line then that conversation needs to start now so that when they're thinking about their next annual budget or their next global fund application that they're including those costs items within there. So I, I do think actually the expectation that government is going to pay for this is okay, as long as you're acting on that expectation as well. Um, so I do, there's an element of 
commercialization and thinking about who can be paying for these systems, absolutely. But also government has a, has a role to play there because these are often public sector systems that we're talking about. And so just as we do with say malaria or HIV or TB, where we get involved in global fund applications and thinking about what are the different activities that you want to get in, that you want to be implementing over the next three, four years and how do you fund for that? I think we need to be taking that approach with technology as well, which is to say, if this is what you want your digital health um, ecosystem to look like in four years time, then what are the different staff, human resources, um, and everything else that we talked about, infrastructure and policies and guidelines that will contribute to that. And let's start planning for that within your budgets, whether that's donor budget requests or whether that's your internal ministry budget. So that's, I think a key part, that's been a key part of this for us is beginning that advocacy early and having those conversations early about the sustainability aspects of it. Yeah, I do agree. And I wonder if there's anyone on the World Bank on this chat, but I know, right, when you look at World Bank loans in transportation or infrastructure, you do see significant loan money being taken out for technology. Um, but in health, it seems to be less so right now when you look at World Bank health loans. And um, But I believe there is an ability for the government to, to pay and to support their development, um, but does require the right country, like in-country governance structure. Anyone else have any other um, comments they want to make on the topic of sustainability? Maybe just, just because uh, I, oh, go ahead, go Beatrice. Ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, I saw um, I think Brenda's comment in the chat, right? That's very related to what Lakshmi just said about, you know, transitioning ownership and country governments, you know, best place to select technology. I think we agree, <laughs> I think we all agree, you know, and that's, that's very critical to the way that, um, you know, at least Global Fund and Gabby and, and some other donors operate. The challenge with that though is, you know, I, so I previously used to work for tech companies and as a tech company, you the ideal is a contract with the government, right? Your, your main client is the government. You want a contract at the government level. There's no access for you though. I, you know, you, I often found, I worked in the DRC market in Kinshasa and, you know, there was no access for us to government decision makers. There was no marketplace. There was no ecosystem for us to operate in. So you're forced to go through this kind of donor funded route or through this NGO or implementer route and take contracts from, you know, implementers who are then working with the government. So there's always this kind of third party involved. And I think the challenge that I'm that I'm trying to bring to Gabby and, and I think that many of us believe in as well is, okay, how, what's our role to play there, right? How can we create better access for local implementers, for tech companies, for private sector, for these solution providers, you know, that, that we can then say to governments, you know, did you know, here's kind of a whole catalog of choices and, you know, current, you know, investment guidance is X, Y, and Z, um, you know, and ultimately it is your choice and we would love to see this in, in the funding applications that, you know, similar to what Lakshmi mentioned. It, there's just sort of that ecosystem and marketplace doesn't exist. And I think we put countries at a disadvantage when we expect them to kind of know everything about all these systems. <laughs> and then we say, okay, you know, you have to write this RFP, you have to choose the system. And they say, you know, we have no idea what, what we're dealing with. And we have no idea if these are viable options. So, you know, as a donor community, I think we can do that better. We can create those marketplaces in a way that we previously maybe have not done quite so well, um, but it, it certainly is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good reminder, right? When any business goes to like buy a software, there's a scoping and a yeah assessment process. And even when I go to buy a new Mac, right? Like there's research that I do to understand what choices to make. Um, and the more companies can make it usable, accessible, um, and have direct lines of communication, I think the more informed countries are on making decisions. Well, we have one minute left, so I just want to sincerely thank um, all the leaders on this call that are leading um, complicated programs around the world to advance digital maturity for taking the time to be here and sh sharing your cross-sectoral input and also just how honest you were. I think, um, you know, especially from the donor side, but from all sides, really being honest on what isn't working and even when we know what we want to do, um, I think sometimes it's hard to figure out how, and so I really appreciate your honest reflection also on what you're struggling with as well as um, how you've been successful. So thank you for yeah, showing up, being here and, and offering your expert advice to this community. So I, I'm gonna sign off and close this panel, but um, I know that people have links to the next keynote um, session, which starts right now. So I'm gonna let people go, but thank you everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. Everyone.
Real pleasure, Caroline. Have a great time. Bye-bye. Bye.